This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Squarespace is an all-in-one website platform that helps you to stand out from the crowd online. The platonic solids are fascinating shapes from engineering, mathematical, and historical perspectives. Kepler theorized that the platonic solids were related to the orbits of the planets. Although this theory was fundamentally wrong, this heralded one of the major shifts in our understanding of the solar system. In this video, we explore the machining of each of these shapes and along the way, we also delve into what makes them so interesting and what happens to these shapes when we try to visualize them in four dimensions. For now, let's start our journey at the simplest platonic solid, the tetrahedron. It's easiest to machine the platonic solids starting from a simple shape, either a cylinder or a sphere, either of which can be machined on the lathe. These initial shapes provide reference points to take measurements from. The tetrahedron is also known as a simplex, the simplest regular polytope that can exist in any number of dimensions. All simplexes can be used to construct another simplex in the next dimension up. For example, two one-dimensional dots form a 2D line, three lines form a triangle, four triangles form a tetrahedron, five tetrahedrons form a four-dimensional five cell, and so on. Here, Alistair machines the tetrahedron by indexing the workpiece into three using the dividing head. To form the angled faces, he mounts the dividing head onto an adjustable angle plate, which has been set to the correct angle. Alternatively, the head could be tilted, but this method would be more restrictive in this instance, because the x-axis couldn't be used without changing the depth of cut. The tetrahedron is parted off to finish. I mentioned that simplexes exist in every dimension, but how can we visualize a 4D shape? This printed model is a stereographic projection of a 4D hypertetrahedron, or 5-cell. The edges heading towards the center of the model represent edges that are projected outwards into four-dimensional space. Alternatively, we could represent that extra dimension using time, as this animation shows. Some increasingly bizarre shapes will appear as we continue through the Platonic series. A regular hexahedron, or what most of us would call a cube, is the next shape. Without a doubt, this is the most trivial to machine, and probably the most ubiquitous platonic solid. One of the most famous cubes is the Rubik's Cube, but a variation of the puzzle exists for every one of the platonic solids. This is made possible by the rotational symmetry of each shape. The 4D relative of a cube is the 8-cell, or Tesseract. Sci-fi fans will no doubt recognize the name from series like Doctor Who and the Marvel Universe. A tesseract is what you would get if you took a 3D net of cubes and folded it into 4D space, the same way that we fold a 2D net of squares into a cube. The octahedron starts to get a bit trickier to machine. After some thought, we opted to mark the faced-off end of the cylinder and mill three faces to these lines. You'd be forgiven for thinking of crystals when you see an octahedron. Many natural crystals are octahedral, including alum, fluorite, and diamond. Metal crystals often form this pattern too, with one famous example being the Toluca meteorite. Once the dividing head was swapped to mill the opposing three faces, a sensitive spirit level was used to set the angular position of the workpiece. The faced and parted sides form the remaining two faces. Platonic solids also crop up frequently in molecular chemistry, and octahedrons are no exception. A group of six atoms or molecules surrounding a central atom will tend to form an octahedral shape, making an easily repeatable unit. If we use octahedrons to make a regular shape in four dimensions, we get the 16 cell. It's getting harder to visualize here, but each bounded shape in this model is still a regular octahedron. They simply look distorted when we try projecting four dimensions down into 3D space. Thanks again to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. In our last video, we showed you some of the core Squarespace design tools, but this time, let's take a look behind the scenes. Squarespace has a wide range of built-in analytics tools that really help you to dig into how visitors are interacting with your website. Essential stats, like visitor sources, are easy to find, but it's also fascinating to see where your audience is based and which buttons receive the most clicks. If you fancy taking it a step further, you can even connect your website to all sorts of third-party tools, like Metapixels and Google Analytics. Beyond analytics tools, you can connect your Squarespace site to all of your social media accounts, allowing you to import content or auto-post to your other profiles without ever having to leave the web editor. To try Squarespace for yourself, head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, 
visit squarespace.com slash Cronova Engineering to get a 10% discount on your first website or domain. We've previously made a small dodecahedron on the lathe, but here Alistair also makes use of the milling machine. He begins by sawing a length of aluminium bar and setting it up in the lathe. So far, all the shapes are formed from a cylindrical reference, but the dodecahedron is more easily machined from a sphere, so this is what we make first. The sphere also has a stub machined on it that can be drilled and tapped so it can be mounted on an arbor for the next machining operations. Before mounting the ball turning attachment, the sphere is roughed by using the top slide. This way, most of the material can be removed using this more rigid setup. Plato once equated each platonic solid to one element, with the dodecahedron representing the universe. Surprisingly, in 2003, a group of cosmologists proposed a similar theory. They put forward a model in which the variations we see in cosmic microwave background radiation could be explained if the bounds of the universe were the shape of a dodecahedron. Another historical enigma is the Gallo-Roman dodecahedron. These dodecahedrons have been found in archaeological excavations across Europe and seem to date back to the 2nd century, but nobody knows exactly what they were made for. Their 12 sides may have been associated with time, either hours in a day or months in a year, but others have speculated applications ranging from knitting aids to religious ornaments. We'd love to hear your theories in the comments. Alistair screws the roughed sphere onto the arbor. By machining the sphere in situ, the resulting geometry is accurately concentric. The sphere can now be transferred between machines, and providing accurate collets are used, a high degree of accuracy can be maintained. Dodecahedrons also crop up in the fullerene family. This is a class of carbon molecules that approximate spheres. The dodecahedron is the simplest of the fullerenes, but in reality, it's so reactive that they rarely exist in isolation. Bigger fullerenes are far more stable, one of the most famous being the Buckminster fullerene, or buckyball. Their ability to encapsulate smaller molecules has made them the target of intensive research in recent years. From this point, it's relatively easy to machine the rest of the shape. The sphere will end up forming the circumscribed sphere of the dodecahedron, that is, the sphere that coincides with the vertices. The inscribed sphere is the sphere that is tangent to the faces of a polyhedron. Remember this because we'll visit it later in the video. You may be wondering how we set the angle of the adjustable angle plate we previously showed you in the video. A great way to do this is to use a clinometer, and here Alistair sets it to the dihedral angle minus 90 degrees with a small correction factor. The dividing head is then bolted to the angle plate, and the workpiece is mounted in the collet. On a small milling machine, such as this one, it's wise to only take small cuts with a large face mill. Instead, Alistair roughs out the faces using an end mill, which has smaller cutting forces, and finishes the faces with the face mill. We've described regular 4D shapes as being formed by the folding of a 3D net of platonic solids. A different way to imagine this is that in the same way as each face here is being milled away to form a regular 2D polygon face, a machinist living in four dimensions could cut away a 3D platonic solid from each 4D face. To machine the opposite faces to those already milled, the dividing head and angle plate are flipped onto the other side of the mill table. The beauty of this approach is that the angle plate can be left set to exactly the same angle as before, and it works for shapes with opposite faces. Incidentally, that's all the platonic solids, apart from the tetrahedron. The opposite faces also make measurement easy, and distance across the faces can be measured with a micrometer. Once complete, the dodecahedron can be parted off in the lathe. Rather than leaving the milled finish on each face, Alistair opts for a linear grain, which is created with a file. Filing by hand allows the workpiece to engage completely with the file, and the result is smooth and accurately flat. Shh. 
The 120 cell, or dodecaplex, is arguably the most elegant of the 4D regular polytopes. This shape is formed from 120 dodecahedrons. Representing these dodecahedrons further and further into 4D space results in this stunning floral fractal pattern. Icosahedrons are comparatively rare in nature, but are a common shape for viruses, especially bacteriophages. These are viruses that infect bacteria. It's estimated that there are more than 10 nanillion, or 10 to the 31, bacteriophages on the planet, more than every other living creature on Earth combined. Bacteriophages reproduce by injecting the DNA from their icosahedron-shaped head into a bacterium, where they hijack the host's protein production, using it to replicate the virus instead. From a machining perspective, there's no doubt that the icosahedron is the most challenging shape. Much like the dodecahedron, we can start with a sphere. Despite the icosahedron having more faces than the dodecahedron, the inscribed sphere is actually smaller for the same circumsphere diameter. The first challenge was machining this shape, as achieving a rotational reference. Alistair proposes cross-drilling and fitting a rod through the boss. Another feature that makes this shape so tricky comes from the fact that five faces meet at the vertices, and any tiny error in the angle therefore appears exaggerated. An interesting application of icosahedrons is actually mapping. The Dymaxion map is a projection of a world map onto the surface of an unfolded icosahedron. One of the advantages of this map style is that the maximum distortion is only 2%. For comparison, the Mercator projection, which is rectangular in shape, makes Greenland look more than five times its real size. Going the opposite direction and folding a net of icosahedrons into 4D space we create the 600 cell, which has the most faces of all the 4D regular polyhedra. The icosahedron is finished in a similar way to the others, although the dividing head needs to be tilted at two angles. To achieve clearance with the collet nose, Alistair uses a dovetail cutter. In the CNC age, it's sometimes easy to forget that seemingly simple geometrical shapes used to be a real challenge to make requiring practical skills, but also a sound understanding of mathematics and geometry. We have now reached the end of the platonic solids. Hexagons may be the best bestagons, but the fact that they tile so well actually makes it impossible to fold a net of hexagons into a regular 3D shape. However, if we continue the series of regular polytopes into four dimensions, another shape emerges. This is a 24 cell, or octoplex, it's special because it doesn't have a 3D analog, and it's also a self-dual, meaning if you constructed a shape from dots drawn on the center of each of its faces, you would end up with another octoplex. Thanks for watching this video. We hope you found this journey through the platonic solids as fascinating as we did, and we hope you found a new appreciation for these incredible shapes. See you in the next one.